Okay, so we have Pastor Garth with us. Welcome him, please. Oh, thank you. Reimbursements there. All right, let me get set up here. I can tap on that. Make sure that my, I guess I could just run this, but I'm just going to go this way. Make sure that my hour and a half, I don't use up all of my hour and a half teaching. Uh, how many got kids somewhere tucked away? You brought them or got to pick them up? Okay, uh, I, I get it. Okay, and uh, we wrap up at 8 o'clock, correct? Okay, and um, we'll give a little time for that too. I'm going to lean this out. Yeah, no, no. I'll tell you why in just a moment. But uh, yeah, I'm thankful for uh, Jeff and April. I'm, I'm glad they got a chance to get away. And you can be seated. Yeah. And um, I'll have you stand up in a minute before we <laughs> open our Bibles. But um, anyway, uh, appreciate the opportunity to teach. I do lead a, a midweek uh, through the Bible. Um, and uh, we have our own uh, kind of rent out a church. And people come from a lot of different uh, churches. And uh, we open our Bibles and we head through the Bible just like you guys are doing. Um, if you're just getting started on that, uh, stick with it. Uh, one of the greatest things you can do is begin to, to learn God's perfect, inerrant, um, eternal word, especially in this crazy world that we live in um, that's speaking a lot of um, ignorant things and uh, good to walk in the truth and good to know your Bible, especially in the days that we live in. And uh, I think if you guys are here for Leviticus, you guys are here for it all, aren't you? Right? Okay. <clears throat> all right. So tonight, I'm going to attempt, and, and I'll just be honest with you, it's my first time, um, doing an overview of the entire book of Revelation. So, listen, um, this is not going to be an in-depth, uh, detailed uh, version because we don't have the time. So if I miss your favorite part or, um, you know, I don't talk about, uh, you know, a detail that you see in the, in the passage, uh, you have to just forgive me. We've got to keep going. But we're going to get an overview here of this book. And um, it's, it is one of the key books uh, of the Bible. And as we'll see tonight, it is uh, the truth of everything that is yet to come. Um, all the things we know are coming, but the details of what it's like when, when they come. So let's stand together. <clears throat> we'll pray tonight. If you, if, you, if you don't have a Bible, you need to get a Bible. So you have to have a Bible for this because I'm not going to be putting up screens for you to follow here. You're just actually going to walk through the chapters. We're not going to read the entire book, but you'll kind of see in your Bible that you know, you'll get the, the gist there. It'll kind of lay out. Sometimes they have a little heading there for each of the seals and the, you know, trumpets and the bowls and all of that and the headings that are there. And we'll just kind of key off of that. <clears throat> but um, we'll ask the Lord to help us tonight. So if you bow your heads with me, Lord, we love you tonight. So thankful that you're an awesome, mighty powerful God. You're in control of the entire earth. And as we know, Lord, we're waiting um, for the return of your son. And the exciting part of it for us as believers is, Lord, we have a date set with you that you're going to take us out. You've gone to prepare a place for us. And that's going to be wonderful before this dreaded day comes. Um, but the rest of the world will fall and be plunged into these, these last days. And um, Lord, you want us to understand what's going to happen because, um, Lord, there's, there's a lot of important parts here, Lord, that um, give us encouragement and strength. Mm -hmm. And also, Lord, to know that you can, can uh, deal with evil, you can wrap up, Lord, all of the wickedness and darkness and sin and death and all of those things, Lord, that they won't go on forever. And we want to be encouraged tonight, Lord, uh, in this book, just like you've, you've um, designed it, Lord, to be for those who love you and follow you. So would you fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, guide us, teach us, 
um, encourage us, Lord, tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. <clears throat> Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. I'll give you a little bit of background here. We'll set up uh, the study of the book. Of course, it's the last book in the Bible. And um, one thing that's wonderful about the Bible, the Bible has a beginning and an end. Um, and you say, well, don't most books have a beginning and an end? Uh, yeah, good books do. Um, because you have a sense of something that you're following from the beginning to the end. And what would the Bible be if God didn't tell us the end? Um, but he's given us a full revelation. And uh, that's the way the Bible's uh, uh, arranged. But you know what? There's a lot of other books of religious, um, you know, in antiquity there that people follow as from God. And uh, let me just tell you, none of them have a beginning and an end. All the great ones, the Quran, the Vedas, uh, all of them, go ahead and read them. They don't, they don't even make sense. They just throw a bunch of things together, a bunch of sayings or surahs or whatever it is. And, and you can't make heads or tails of it. God said, no, I... I I want you to know uh, everything from beginning to end. And so it's only the Bible that is clear and meaningful. And I'm telling you, it's only the Bible. And, uh, and so there's a reason, you know, that we, when we go to the Bible, we see clarity here. And uh, God wants us to know from the beginning, you know, where, where everything came from, why it's here, how he created it, who made, you know, who made it, uh, why he made it. Um, you know, who is he and uh, why do we need uh, to be saved? And, uh, and again, about his salvation and all of those things. And here in the last final book, he lays out and explains how everything will be wrapped up and his kingdom, his eternal kingdom will move forward. Everybody gets a sense of this, um, believer or unbeliever, that the world's heading toward an end. And uh, we can see that it's, it's the signs are within man, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that. But, but how is it going to end, and, and why is it going to end? And this is what the book of Revelation does for us. So it's a nightmare to unbelievers. Some of you that are believers going, I, I'm, I'm kind of too afraid to read it too. Um, no, it's not meant for that. It's meant for comfort that we understand. And, um, and so for them, it's a nightmare, but... Uh, to understand its meaning um, is brings peace and um, brings a sense of no matter how chaotic it gets in this world, I know God's un got it under control. It's all marching toward toward His His conclusion. So let me just give you a couple of things. It's a prophetic book, obviously, and um, it, uh, this book here also kind of has a beginning and an end. It, it goes through a, a length of time that called the tribulation for the most part. Um, but it gives you an overview here, but it goes all the way out into the, the uh, kingdom of the Lord, the millennial kingdom, and out into the eternal um, uh, kingdom, uh, eternity, basically. So um, there's 404 prophecies and re uh, references in the book of Revelation, and 278 of them are from the Old Testament. So in some sense, you need to read, you need to kind of have a sense of the whole Bible in order to really understand the book of Revelation, and um, uh, that's part of its design because it's fulfilling a lot of these prophecies um, as uh, God lays out the end times. Keys to in, uh, interpreting the book of Revelation, let me just try to make it as simple as we can. Uh, there's some uh, main um, themes and main characters here. Uh, that we need to understand. Number one is the nations. Uh, we're going to talk about kingdoms, um, and the kingdoms are going to rise up eventually to try to take out the Lord and, and, and of course, uh, his bride that comes with him. And um, why are the kingdoms in a rage? Psalm 2, right? Uh, why do they plot a vain thing? Well, it's part of the nations represent Babylon, and so when you think of the nations, what are they doing? They're really seeking a way to remove God and to build their, right, the Babel, the Tower of Babel. And uh, that's why it's called Mystery Babylon. It's, it's a rebellion. It's a full-out rebellion. And God says, this time I'm going to destroy it all by fire. 
um, last time he, you know, again, confused the speech, but it's been going on forever. Man's been plotting to get together, and this is what we're seeing in the end, end time. So that's why we have, um, um, you know, a lot of talk of a world order and, uh, you know, uh, everything starting to come together. Man is already plotting it. He's found his way around the language barriers and with the technology and things that we have now, he can, you know, find this and make this great society that excludes God. And so the Gentile nations are really spoken of when we think of Babylon here. Um, number two is the church. And the church is mentioned here in this book in the beginning. Um, but um, the church represents the true believers, obviously, in Jesus. And, um, but there's another side to it because there's going to be a whole religious system that's going to be built and it's going to be um, ran by the false prophet and uh, he's going to be one of the main characters and it's false religion. And so there's uh, this great harlot that's spoken of here, but she's got a whole system going and it's a religious system and um, you need to understand that here because Man is fine with uh, worshiping false gods. He just doesn't want to worship the true and living God. And so religion is okay as long as it isn't Christianity, right? And, uh, and so this idea of them being religious and, and you know, worshiping all kinds of false gods and, and spiritism and all kinds of wickedness, man's uh, good with that. And this will be a worldwide religion. Uh, Satan is, of course, a key character in the book of Revelation. Why? Because, um, you know, he's the adversary of God's people. And this is about his end as well. And, um, and he's going to be rep represented by the Antichrist, which is another main character here. Um, and he's going to be the one uh, wanting to be worshipped like God. And so it's going to be a fulfillment during this short season that uh, Satan is going to try to pull around him. Um, you know, his own false trinity, and he's going to begin to want to bring the world into worship of him. Sad days, because man really doesn't want to worship anyone, absolutely. He, he loves himself, so there's going to be its own chaos that'll uh, ensue. But the key to the book of Revelation is not any of those things. It is um, Israel, okay? So the Bible and all these 278 prophecies, a lot of them have to do with Israel. And so this whole uh, last seven years, and we know that because of the book of Daniel and that prophecy was given by the angel. And he said, listen, let me give you the full gamut of all of prophecy that wraps up everything all the way to the end. And he gives it in, um, in um, uh, 49, excuse me, 77s. Okay, so he lays everything out in, in increments of sevens, which are seven years, and there's 70 groups of seven, and history unfolds, and we see it all unfold all the way up to the 69th seven, but we never see the 70, 70th seven, because that is a, a, a last seven years that is reserved for the completion of all of this prophecy, and Satan is included in it, the Antichrist is included in it, and he lays it all out in in uh, Daniel chapter 9. So the nation of Israel is important because the book, uh, the center of the book is about Israel. It's about one nation that is turned away from God throughout all of its history. But for the fi final um, time in this middle of this great horrific uh, season, Israel will repent and they'll turn back. And it's about the fulfillment of all of his promises to them. Of course, Israel is Israel because God brought the Savior through Israel, and He made great promises to Israel, and He's been, he's, He hasn't rejected them, and He's going to fulfill them, as Paul said in Romans chapters nine, ten, and eleven. Basically, made his case to say God's not finished with Israel yet. So it's the key to understanding Revelation. Now, if you take that out of the book of Revelation, and you do not, you no longer see that God has a plan for Israel. Um, that's called replacement theology, and a lot of churches believe in that, a lot of churches. And so um, if they take that out, then they take Israel out of the book of Revelation, then you can't understand it. And that's why in the interpretation of it, 
we'll see that there are three different view, uh, four different views the way that you approach the book of Revelation, and three of them reject Israel, that God has a plan for Israel, which also rejects the millennial reign of Christ, right? Because if Christ can't come down and reign, he's going to reign in Jerusalem, the Bible says, and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years, and there'll be peace on the earth. And there's hundreds, almost a thousand different uh, prophecies speaking of the second coming of Christ. And uh, all of them are, uh, you know, literal, uh, literally fulfilled, and uh, they can't be fulfilled. So four views, you don't need to write them down. First one's preterism, and that just, that just means the view is saying, we just, when we read this book, we think it all happened in history. I don't know anybody can read this book and think, oh, yeah, I remember when that happened, uh, because it didn't happen. And so, but they do. Why? Because... Uh, it's primarily the Roman Catholic Church that founded this view, and they did it because they didn't like Israel, and uh, they wanted to be the central church, and they wanted Christ to return in Rome, and so all of it uh, was done away with. And some people believe, you know, uh, that all of it happened right at Jesus, uh, after Jesus died on the cross and rose again uh, there, and uh, Israel was, you know, put down in Jerusalem. They believe that unfolded. Um, in, the, in those seven years, but there's really a partial preterism that's more popular, and that's, uh, again, from the Roman Catholic Church, and they believe that that happened at the fall of Rome, and um, so, um, but that means all of it happened in history. Idealist, which is really the all-millennial view, which means there really isn't a millennium, which there isn't really a literal reign of Christ coming, and so they basically look and take the book as just symbolic, uh, as a metaphor uh, for the struggle between good and evil. It's hard to read the, bio, uh, the book of Revelation if that's all you're looking for. Um, and a lot of the churches, uh, Methodist Church, Lutheran Church, Anglican Church, uh, you know, a lot of the Reformed Church, uh, Christian Reformed, Dutch Reformed, all of those, um, uh, hold that position, and of course, they don't really even teach uh, the book of Revelation. Historical is a post-millennial view and uh, belief that Christ will return after the millennial age, right? Uh, they, re they view Revelation as a panorama of church history, so they just stretch it out throughout all of church history, and you say, well, who's the people who believe in that? Well, Bethel Redding, you know, I've heard about them, and um, uh, there's another um, word uh, there, the kingdom now groups and uh, Christian reconstructionism, all of that. They're just so far off, they've lost the whole trail because they lost the key to the interpretation of the book of, of Revelation. They think that somehow the church is going to be the catalyst to bring in peace uh, to the world. The Bible says it's not going to happen. The Lord's going to have to judge uh, the earth in order to do it. So um, we need to keep get, mo get moving here. So chapter 1, verse 1. Let me give you a little bit of an outline. Oh, I'm sorry, the last one, futurist. <laughs> that is that basically after chapter 3, when we stop talking about the church, uh, from 4 on, all of those are events that haven't happened yet. And as you read them, though, there's, uh, th this is all future. This is why it's a prophetic book. And um, again, when you put Israel in it and you put all the key characters in it, it makes sense. And it's a fulfillment of everything that God has been promising from the beginning. Chapter 1, verse 1 says, uh, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. So what is this uh, book about? It's about Jesus Christ. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. And as we'll see in chapter 1 here, it's an unveiling of him in a different mode. And so a lot of churches like Jesus being meek and mild, but he's the king of kings and lord of lords. And so um, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. And, and again, this is his day because he's going to judge all the wickedness, all the evil. He's going to put down all of the rebellion. And it is his time uh, to do that. That's why he's king of kings. There's not going to be another king. He'll be the only king, and the whole earth will sit under one king, and it'll be Jesus, and they'll sit under right, a righteous king, which I don't know about you, I'm excited about, right? Give me a righteous king. So it's an unveiling of him. 
He's the chief subject of it. He's the center of it. He's the one who's really, in a sense, br moving all of it forward, as we'll see. So um, uh, he's not the suffering lamb. Now, why did God give us this book, and why is it the last book <laughs> in the Bible? Um, again, he gave us this book, and this book is given and written to the church. And uh, it was given to the seven churches, and it's given to all of us. Why? Because God wants us to know, first of all, um, our role in this is, is we're going to be viewing this from heaven. And, um, and, and again, no matter what happens in the tribulation that happens in this world, it's not going to be as bad as what is coming. And the Lord promises to rescue us and to take us out. And so it's a book filled with hope for the believer. And again, it ties up and helps us understand how God's going to fulfill what he promised to Israel. And so that's why we don't have to confuse the two or bring the two to one. And, um, and again, shows us how Satan is going to be defeated and um, um, evil is going to be put down. Is going to be put down. Important verses: Revelation one nineteen. Revelation one nineteen says, "Write uh, the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this." So the layout of the book, the order of it is threefold. Uh, the first one are the things which you have seen, and he writes that after seeing the vision of Jesus, chapter one. That's the revelation of Jesus. Chapters two and three are the things which are, which are the is the church age. And um, so we're going to go through the seven churches and, and see how the Lord judges his church. And that's an awesome thing. And then from that point on, chapters 4 to 22 are the things which will take place after this. They're all future. So we just lay it out in a simple way. So chapter 1, the hero, the savior, Jesus. Um, this is a description. John, uh, the beloved uh, on the Isle of Patmos, he's, uh, the Lord appears to him and, and gives him this and tells him, write this down, write these things down. I'm going to give you a revelation that's going to be for the church, my church, for throughout all of history. And um, so <clears throat> he uh, sees this vision, and then Revelation 1, uh, um, 16, he says he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Again, a lot of likes in that whole description because he really couldn't put it into words the way that he saw the Lord. Uh, we just went through, we're going through the Bible and the book of Isaiah, and we just went through Isaiah chapter 6 where Isaiah sees the Lord. Um, and he, he had a tough time describing the whole thing. He was basically trembling and wanted to die. It's going to be awesome to see the Lord. He's perfect. He's He's um, pure. Uh, the angels circle around in, in the throne of God and they say, holy, holy, holy. We don't understand what holy is. We don't even have anything to look at, right? Not in the physical world. I mean, it's the best it gets is, is some people who live for the Lord, but not in perfect, pure righteousness, perfect goodness, perfect love, just to be in the midst of that. I mean, people say, well, what's heaven really going to be like? It's going to be great, that's what's going to be awesome about it. We can't even understand how great it's going to be. In fact, to be in the presence of God in his pureness, the Bible says it would just kill us. And so Isaiah said, man, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. I, I feel like I, I want to die. When I look at you, I see the real me. And um, God says, no, I'm going to transform you uh, and we'll be able to be in his uh, presence. So he has a sword coming out of his mouth, and that means the Lord is, is going to judge. It's not a real sword, but the, the, the way that he judges is with his word. And his word is a sword, and the Bible backs that up as well. And it's powerful, and the Lord speaks, and it happens. And so judgment is coming. The seven stars represent the, the seven churches. And he gives a preview to chapters 2 and 3. Tells John, listen, don't be afraid, it's me. He's like, it's you? It's, it's me, Jesus. And, of course, he walked with him, and he was uh, the, the, the one Jesus loved. You know, he was in the inner circle, and, and, uh, but he was afraid when he looked at him because he's awesome. 
And it is going to be awesome when we see this thing unfold. Uh, chapters 2 and 3, the things which are the seven churches in Asia, modern day Turkey, right? And um, so John was ministering there um, and then exiled to the island of Patmos, but God gives it in sevens. There's a lot of sevens in the book. Seven is the number of perfection. And so he writes to seven churches that are in, in Asia Minor. And uh, but they represent the whole church, and so a lot of different interpretations about these seven churches won't go into all of that. Um, but um, the idea is Jesus is the head of the church, and he judges the church. Now, there's some churches that are good churches, there's some churches that are bad churches, there's some churches that are following the Lord, there's some churches that are disobeying the Lord, there's some churches have a little bit of both. And he, and he, as you go through each of the seven churches, you see that. And you realize that just because it's a church doesn't mean that everyone in it is a believer. And judgments that he, he brings, it. there's a lot of people, and I just mentioned a bunch of movements today and, and churches that say they're Christian churches, but some of them, they're not Christian at all. And the Lord threatens, he said, listen, you, you won't make it. You're, you're not going to be a part of the rapture. And uh, so it's an awesome thing there, but the Lord can judge the church, churches, and that means bodies of people that come in in the name of Christ. And again, if you read through the seven churches, there's a lot of wickedness going on in there. I mean, some are just outright, flat out wicked. And I'm looking at some of the denominations today that are folding into wickedness. They're embracing all kinds of sexual perversion, and they're making them their pastors and their leaders. It's wicked, it's dark, it's evil. It's everything the Bible says is dark. And so Jesus says, I see it all. I see it all. And he's going to judge it uh, for the works. And he tells them uh, to rep repent. So it's a sober um, thing to read through this uh, section here. And um, uh, knowing that the Lord sees it all. And he's there. And we are like the candlestick that's there, the seven uh, thing there. He has the seven stars in his hands, which is probably the pastor's there. And he sees all of them, and he sees the church. And, of course, there's going to be judgment. So it's a reminder for us as the church, we're going to be judged, not for our sin, but for our works, things that we've done, deeds that we've done for the Lord. It's called the beam of judgment. And it's a day we're going to stand before the Lord. It's going to be awesome. And he's going to put before us, what have you done for the Lord? And he's going to reward us accordingly. And for some, the Bible says everything's going to be burned up. They still made it in. Uh, they, they, you know, they were believers. They loved the Lord, but they didn't have any works uh, there. Uh, so it's going to be an awesome day. Um, now's our time. We don't have a lot of time left. Okay, chapters four through eighteen. We're going to look at a lot of, you know, judgments that are going to come. So chapter 4 is very interesting because after we leave uh, here, we, we no, no longer see the church again. I think 17 times we see the word church. Church isn't used again until the last chapter, <laughs> and that's when he's talking about give this book to the church. But we do see the church, but the church is in another form. The church is a bride that's coming with Christ, and that's um, uh, in chapter 19. So from that span... Uh, again, the church is, is gone. And then we see a different thing, uh, a word used. We see saints used. So in the tribulation time, it'll be saints. Those who, who believe in Christ will be called uh, the saints, set apart unto the Lord. And, uh, but they won't be called uh, the church. And uh, God's doing a work. <clears throat> People are still being saved. Chapter 1. Ch uh, Revelation 4, verse 1 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven... And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you the things which must take place after this. So, uh, we see a transition. John is now taken up, caught away, and the scene is now up in heaven. And I think there's, a, again, a simple understanding here that at the end of that last day when Paul said the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, it's now Israel's time. And I'm going to begin to graft them back into the branch, but he's taking his bride out. The trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will rise first. Those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. 
The Lord doesn't come down to the earth, but we're caught up to him. And then we go away into heaven with him. And so that's a picture of what's happening. The door is standing open. He says, come up. And, um, and now we get a picture from heaven. And um, again, this is a picture of, of the rapture. The Bible says in John 17, 16, it says, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Our home is not on this earth. We'll rule and reign with the Lord on this earth, but our home is in heaven. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Uh, he says, in my father's house are many ma mansions. And so he's gone to prepare a place for us. Wait till you see the place he's preparing. It's pretty exciting. He gives us a picture of it uh, here, and it's going to be wonderful. Um, uh, First Thessalonians 5, 9 says, For God did not appoint us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a day of wrath, and God's not going to put his church through wrath. He, he never has throughout his history, and he promises that I'm not going to put my bride through this wrath. So that's why a pre-tribulation rapture is what the Bible teaches. So after here, Revelation 4, 2 through 5, it says, immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like jasper, um, a, which is like a diamond, and a sardius ruby stone in appearance. And he's given the description of God on the throne. And it's just like, wow, the beauty, because we see the light and the reflection off of this basically diamond and ruby figure that's there. And again, it's very, very much vague. Uh, there, but it says, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. So you put that on the backdrop and put light through all of that, and it's get it's would be amazing. Around the throne were uh, 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads, and from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. I mean, this is ramping up for judgment. Heaven is preparing to unleash this judgment upon earth and the Lord himself. And uh, what a picture and uh, lightning and thunderings. And it says seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So we're going to see that it'll be the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit all around the throne uh, at this time. And we'll see Jesus in just a minute here uh, as a revelation here in chapter four and five. Twenty four elders that are on the thrones. Um, nobody knows exactly uh, who they are, but I believe that, um, in my opinion, some people think that the uh, rapture uh, is only going to take away the church. Um, it's possible, though, that the rapture could include all of those who believe in Christ, because Old Testament saints were also looking forward to Christ. Daniel says in Daniel 12, he kind of says that that's not going to happen until the end of the tribulation, that the Old Testament saints are going to get bodies. And when I say resurrected, it doesn't mean they're waiting in the grave. They're already present with the Lord, but they're, they don't have their bodies, uh, which is what we're going to be like Christ, right? We're going to see him, touch him, see him face to face. Both of us have faces, right? And, uh, and so um, if, if that's true, then all of those who are looking forward to Christ, anybody, any Gentile, anywhere, any time in the world who was uh, turning to God and God reveals himself in, in, in each of our hearts, um, then there, there's a resurrected body. If so, then you could have 12 thrones that are there for the 12 tribes, right? And those uh, representing, uh, you know, Israel and God's law and all of that. And then you could have 12 uh, tribes, uh, 12 thrones also for the 12 apostles and 12 disciples, our representation of that. And those are on thrones all the way around. Why are they on thrones? Because the Bible says we're going to rule and reign with Christ. And that's part of the, uh, one of the things as a believer, we're preparing to be put to use during the thousand years. The Lord's going to use us and we're going to be joint heirs with Christ, but we're also going to rule and reign with him. We're going to have assignments. And uh, don't pick Hawaii because I think other people have picked it if you get that region. But actually, in the end of the book of Revelation, all the islands are put down. So uh, you, won't have, you won't have a ministry. Okay. So awesome. What a beautiful picture. One of the great pictures that we have in all of the Bible of the throne of God. 
And then uh, chapter 5, we see it unfolds that John, uh, you know, begins to weep here because there's a scroll. Uh, um, all of heaven is anticipating that, you know, I think heaven would love to see the judgment. I know the, the people that are there with the Lord would like to see evil put down. And uh, it's a unanimous uh, thing there. And so we'll see here who is worthy, chapter 5, verse 2, to open the scroll and loose its seal. And they looked around in, in heaven and there was nobody. John didn't see that there was anybody worthy to open the this, this scroll. So he begins to weep. He's thinking, man, my goodness, there's got to be somebody who can, um, again, um, bring judgment and close uh, this and defeat evil and defeat Satan. Um, and so he wept much, uh, verse 4, because there was no one found worthy to open and read the scroll or to loose it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, uh, this is speaking of Jesus, isn't it, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. What an awesome picture. So it's the way that he'll, he'll be. Look, he'll still, the Bible says he's going to still have his, his nail printed scars uh, in his hands and his feet and um, uh, the stripes and all of that. And so this is a part of uh, how we're going to see Jesus um, in, even in his glorified body. And uh, he sees him there as being slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth and see the picture of uh, the Holy Spirit. So um, Jesus, the only one who's worthy to bring uh, the judgments. And so Revelation 5.12 says, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory. And uh, basically, it's wonderful to see that all of heaven begins to worship and praise. And then we see everything ramping up there that uh, they're, um, we, they know the time is coming and the judgment is coming and heaven is rejoicing over it. Um, why? Because you know, evil will be put down and uh, judgment will finally come. And uh, so uh, there's a lot of worship. And in heaven, there's worship, unity, peace, joy. But on the earth, the rebellion continues and the nations and Israel and Satan and demons and all of that goes on. Chapter 6 through 11. Chapter 6 through 11, we're going to see the judgment begins, and uh, it's hard to really understand because there's going to be three sets of judgments that are going to be sent out, and the seals, and then the trumpets, and then the bowls, and uh, they kind of reflect um, many things, but um, we know this, that Jesus is the one opening them, and Jesus is the one is unleashing them, and he's the one moving things uh, forward, and so this tribulation period again, is going to be a, a seven-year period, and we know it's going to begin when this Antichrist, who we don't know who it is yet, he makes a covenant with Israel for seven years, and he signs that, then you know that's the one who makes the deal, and he's going to break the deal halfway through, three and a half years in, and we'll see that, um, but the, the, 60, the 70th week uh, has begun. So, um, Satan is going to be unleashed here, as we'll see, to do his thing. Um, chapter 6, the seven seals, 6, 1 and 2. It says, now I saw when the lamb opened the, one of the seals, um, they said, come and see. And I looked and behold, a white horse who sat on it, and it, it, he had a, bow, a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. So as he's described here, we think, well, that's the Lord. He's on the white horse. Um, but we quickly understand that it isn't the Lord. The Lord's not coming till the end of the tribulation, and he'll come with uh, all the other horses and, and uh, the bride riding with him. Um, it is not the Lord. It is Satan. Uh, basically, the Antichrist is unleashed, and Satan is unleashed. They call him the the four horsemen here, because the first four are these uh, different colored uh, horses, kind of iconic figures, uh, basically, of hell being unleashed. 
And so the first one, this white one, he's on a white horse. He's going out to conquer. And um, again, the Bible says that, and this is important to know, that Satan isn't the one who's driving the boat or running the show. Um, he has to be released. And so 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as you read it, uh, Paul is you know, giving comfort to the church who thinks they're already in the tribulation and they're kind of freaking out. And he says, no, 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 you know, I've already explained to you how this is going to work. You, you can't be in the tribulation uh, because I already shared with you in the first book uh, um, to the uh, Thessalonians that there's going to be a rapture, you're going to be taken out. And, and, but then he explains that the lawless one um, it has to you know, is be released. And it isn't going to be released until the church is taken out. And so the Lord is in control of the timing. So the Lord knows exactly the day and the hour when all those things are going to happen. And um, he's in control. And so what does he do at the very beginning here? He releases this uh, Satan to begin to do really whatever he wants to do, in a sense. He takes a lot of the leash off. And uh, Satan is subdued. He doesn't get to do everything that he wants to do. But that'll be loosened up, and he'll be allowed to go out and to conquer. And that's what the tribulation is going to be. He will be ravaging, and then the Lord will also be, again, from heaven, uh, directing things. So um, basically, four horses. Uh, there's the Antichrist, and then war is going to be unleashed. Uh, famine is going to be unleashed, and death is going to be unleashed, and unprecedented for, uh, unprecedented. Uh, volumes uh, here we'll see across the earth. We're going to see a third of the earth die, quarter of the earth die. Uh, that's a lot. And um, be a, a lot of death, a lot of war, and those things as well. Basically, you take the church out. It's going to get dark, isn't it? Uh, really quickly. Um, Jesus isn't holding anything back uh, anymore. So what are these four horsemen here? Uh, some say that it's a big picture of what is coming uh, to the earth, uh, the Antichrist, war, famine, and death. And it's more of an overview of all of the book of Revelation, possibly so. Seal 5, the martyred saints. Again, a characteristic of the um, um, tribulation. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to come to Christ. And um, the main characters of witness are going to be the Jewish uh, 144,000. But people are going to be taking the gospel all across the world, at least in the first three and a half years. And the Bible says many will come to the Lord, but with that, um, there's going to be an attack on them like never before, uh, believers, and they're going to be put to death. So the martyred saints, uh, many will die for their faith, again, um, which, again, praise the Lord, um, but it'll be common for, and the Bible speaks about their heads being cut off and uh, for their uh, witness. Seal 6, the great earthquake. Uh, ends the, um, you know, kind of the last part of the seals here, and the earth is, is shaken. I don't believe this is the greatest earthquake. It'll be an earthquake, and uh, God's going to be manipulating a lot of things during this time. But at the very end, the last part, before the Battle of Armageddon, there's going to be a great earthquake like never before, and that's going to rock the entire earth and reshift a lot of things. Uh, we'll see that in hopefully in another hour. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. Seal 7 is a holy hush. And uh, so um, uh, chapter 8 there, um, and it contains really the, the last seal contains the seven trumpets. So it rolls over on itself. And the seventh trumpet contains the seven bowls. Um, so we have a pause that, here. And in this, we see this uh, pause, chapter 8, verse 1 through, through 6 here, the 144,000 witnesses. And yes, they are Jehovah's Witnesses, um, but they're all Jewish. Ah, yeah. And there's 12,000 from each tribe. So yes, the Lord's going to have witnesses, and, uh, but that's who they are. And um, there's tw uh, 12,000 from each tribe. God still knows uh, the tribes. And if you talk to people, they uh, Jewish people, a lot of them know their tribe. And uh, so the uh, Bible calls them basically male virgin Jews. And uh, in the sense, their hearts are there. They're given to the Lord. I think early, this is early on, he sets this up. And he says that they're going to uh, be able to be a witness for 
you know, 1,260 days, which is three and a half years, I think they'll be the dominant witness to the world for the first three and a half years of the tribulation. Things are really going to change um, at the end there um, at the halfway mark. But um, God's going to supernaturally keep them as well. And we're going to see that he's going to meet with them on Zion and uh, um, they're not going to get to die. Anybody read the Left Behind series? Buck and Chloe and everybody going, okay. One of the fascinating things I believe too is God's going to put a supernatural hand on them. Everybody's going to want to kill them, uh, uh, but um, God's going to put his hand over them. They will be a part, I believe. Some say they're, they die and the Lord, you know, gives them, you know, a blessing uh, for their faithfulness because Satan puts them to death. But uh, I believe they're going to make it through the tribulation and they'll be a part of those that go into the millennial kingdom. Um, as well, which is uh, interesting. Chapters 8, uh, 7 through 11, the seven trumpets. The first four look like nuclear, you know, weapons. Could be asteroids. The Lord could just, you know, bring the stars down as well. But we see the vegetation, the seas, the waters, um, you know, the heavens, they're blocked out. Uh, so major devastation that will be unleashed, uh, kind of like a nuclear war, which Um, There's nations that are talking about it today, aren't they? And uh, then the last three are the woe judgments. So you got locusts from the bottomless pit and basically more opening of more demons uh, coming out from under the earth there. A lot of uh, the Bible does speak about some that have been restrained, some demons that have been restrained by the Lord. And those being able to be let out, they're led by this Apollyon, the destroyer, which is basically Satan. So there's be a lot of demonic uh, activity uh, on the earth. Uh, You talk about dark, it'll be wicked and dark and uh, evil. Uh, Six is war, kind of like, looks like maybe like a war somewhere in the Middle East. Some say it's a description of Armageddon. So again, some people say as you go through each of them, when you get to the seven, it goes all the way to the end of the tribulation. They're just describing it in three different ways, um, but um, don't I don't know about that. Um, but we do know this through the last three plagues. The Bible says that a third of the earth is going to die in those last three plagues, from the locusts, from uh, the um, uh, five, six, and seven. Um, those last three woe judgments. Uh, Revelation nine. Uh, 20 and 21 says, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent. That's one of the amazing things about the book of Revelation. You see all this unfolding and men know that it's God because God's going to tip them off. There's going to be signs in the heavens and all of it. And they know that this is uh, God's involved here, but they won't repent. And it's amazing thing to see that the wickedness of man, it says they did not repent of the works of their hands. And they, they kept worshiping demons and idols and all of that. And it says, and then they did not repent of their murders, of their sorceries, of their sexual immorality or their thefts. They, they wouldn't do it. At one point, they just shake their fist at God and they just said, just put a rock over me, crush me. I'm not going to serve you. Can you imagine? People say, if, I, if there was a God, I would serve him. If I knew there was a God, I would, I would bow my knee. Not going to happen. We'll deal with that at the very end. Chapter 10, a mighty angel with a little book. Uh, Seven thunders are uttered. And again, I think the earth is going to hear things from heaven. And God is going to speak. And it's going to be dynamic, amazing. And uh, again, men will, for the most part, turn their hearts cold. And they'll reject uh, the powerful word of the Lord. John ends up eating it, the little book. And um, it's sweet. But basically, it's a reminder from what he sees to go and preach the gospel, because I think we're at a time when people don't want to hear it anymore. A pause takes place, chapter 10 here. Uh, two witnesses are revealed. I believe that will be Moses and Elijah, um, one representing the law, one representing the prophets. Of course, Elijah didn't taste death. He went up in, in a uh, whirlwind um, chariot of fire. Um, but I do think they were both of them uh, together were a part of the mount at the Mount Tr- of Transfiguration, which is a symbol of the Lord in his glory as he's going to appear in the second coming. And who did he have with him? He had Moses and Elijah with him. 
And uh, he sets up these two witnesses again for 1,260 days, and the earth's going to um, be a little freaked out by them as well. They're going to have power to speak and, and, and fire from their mouth and, and envelop people who, who come to kill them. And uh, God's going to give them supernatural power, and they're going to be there in Israel, and they're going to be a witness as well. The earth's going to get a lot of witness of the Lord, and uh, so nobody will, not, will be lacking that. It's just going to be those who refuse to turn to the Lord. The screws are going to keep, keep um, being put on uh, uh, and tighter and tighter. Revelation 10, 7 says, but in uh, the, the days of the sounding of the seventh seal, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. And uh, as he uh, um, declared to his uh, servants, Revelation 11 says, then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lights, noises, thunderings and earthquakes and great hail. Can you imagine the world seeing all that? He's, anybody who doesn't know, he's going to send angels to fly around the earth and tell people to repent and all of it. I believe this is coming up to the middle chapters here. Chapters 12 and 13 are kind of the midpoint here. He's going to describe some of the characters. we got to hurry. Okay. So, mid-tribulation kind of uh, time here. God takes a, uh, a little bit of a pause here, chapters 12 and 13, and he begins to uh, give us the dynamics of what's going on through a story here, and it has to do with uh, um, four different play, or excuse me, seven different players. They're key figures. Number one is the woman, and uh, the story goes, she gives birth, and the woman is Israel. And who did she give birth to? She gave birth to Jesus, uh, the Savior. And of course, he, was, he died, and he was uh, caught up in, into heaven. And then it speaks here, the great red dragon, which is Satan. And then the third player is, uh, of course, the son that was born. That's Jesus. And then the fourth is Michael, because in this same time, we're going to see that there's going to be a battle that's going to go on in heaven. You know, we know that from reading Daniel that the angels have war uh, sometimes. Uh, the word is coming there, and, and, and dem demonic angels want to... Keep the word from coming, and Daniel says, I pressed through, and uh, excuse me, the angel Michael says he pressed through. Now he's going to be leading the battle of God's angels against the, de the, the demons. So there's going to be a spiritual war that's going on here, and um, Satan is going to be cast out of heaven. Um, he's going to, during this time of the tribulation, he's not going to be able to come to the throne of God anymore to accuse the brethren, as we see in the Bible. Even Jesus said, Satan has asked to sift you, uh, Peter, and uh, he is not going to have that access anymore. Um, he's going to be cast out of the heavenly realm, and he's going to be brought down onto the earth because it's their last days as well. Of course, it's going to make him angry, right? Uh, Revelation 12, 9 says, so the uh, great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, I don't know when that will happen, if the beginning, but possibly at the middle of the tribulation. Again, this is when Satan is, uh, through the Antichrist, is getting ready to go into the temple of Israel, uh, the rebuilt temple on the Temple Mount, and he's going to defile it, uh, the abomination that causes desecration that the Bible speaks of in the Old Testament and in the New Testament at the three and a half year mark. And he's going to set up this statue that, to be worshipped for all the world to worship him. And uh, during this time, uh, that war is going to take place he, uh, uh, possibly, and he's going to be cast out there and he's going to be enraged. And at the same time is when he's going to realize that Israel is not going to follow him anymore. Their eyes are going to be open. And so those of Israel who haven't turned to the Lord yet will turn to the Lord. And as Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 24, when you see this happening, the abomination, he says, get up, don't pack your bags, come off of the roof and run. And he's talking about those in Judah. And a lot of Israel has come from all over the world and they're, they're in the land. And uh, millions and have been gathered from all nations there. And so primarily the most uh, greatest amount of Jewish uh, people will be there in, you know, the Jerusalem area and Judea area. And he says, listen, run. And if you've ever been there, it's not that far to run. 
as you begin to go out. But the Bible also says that God's going to do a supernatural work in um, uh, helping them run. He's going to give them wings of, of, of an eagle. And uh, literally, there's going to be a supernatural carrying away of... Because Satan's in rage and he wants to kill all of them. And, um, and so um, God's going to protect them. Some think they're going to go to a place called Petra, a rock in, enclosure there. But they're going to be protected by the Lord for the, for the last three and a half years. He's going to keep them. And um, I don't know if they'll be translated there because the Bible, you know, God can translate if he wants. Or if there'll be a literal, you know, supernatural thing of the angels uh, guiding them. Uh, there, but it'll be needed because he's going to want to, um, again, uh, destroy all of Israel because he knows what's coming. Player five, the remnant of the woman's seed. Um, and that just speaks of this repentant Israel. And uh, they will, it'll be almost all of Israel will be saved. Those who aren't believers will die in the tribulation. But in the end, all of Israel will be saved is what uh, Paul says in uh, Romans chapter 11. So then we have the, uh, the beast out of the sea, which is the Antichrist, and he'll be in full bore here, as we just spoke about. He's controlling all the nations, all the national, national powers. That's the ten horns that were there. Of course, three were taken out, but with him, that's uh, be eight horns, but seven other horns. He's powerful, European. Um, the Bible says a revived Roman Empire. It'll be you know, ten toes of clay connected to the iron feet. And so there'll be a revived Roman Empire. If you're watching the Europe Europe right now, you're seeing them adjust, aren't they? And they're thinking about building some pretty big military power. They don't want to be treated like they're watching Ukraine be treated. Uh, and so uh, things are shifting, things are changing. And so I wouldn't uh, doubt if they became uh, united together in their own powerful uh, army, but they'll be the ones controlling a lot of things on the earth at that time. So um, then we see uh, the Antichrist, then we see the, the beast out of the earth, um, which is the false prophet. And that's that religious system that I was talking to you about. It'll be a worldwide system. Some people think that the woman who rides the beast is going to be uh, from Rome, because the descriptions are, again, European there. We see the Pope now embracing all kinds of religion. And so it's a possibility, but it'll be a powerful position. And one of the things that the um, false prophet will do is he'll institute the mark of the beast. Now, we don't know what that is, but you can't buy or sell without it. It's the mark 666 or 666. No way for us to know who that is, but we, we, we would if we were here when that peace uh, accord is uh, signed. But have to have that mark. It's not a big deal anymore. We can all get that, right? Um, you know, uh, it's like one more mandate, right? <laughs> How quickly can you put in these mandates for everybody? And uh, with computer chips today, um, he can do it. But what is he doing? He's doing it for uh, the way to identify those who don't take the mark. Because he wants to destroy all of them. And we're going to see at the end, the woman who rides the beast, this false prophet, is going to be drunk with the blood of the martyrs. So that's going to be their job, is to root out all false religion, which is anybody who follows Jesus, right? Follow any other god or demon or bird or whatever it is, but you can't, can't follow uh, Jesus. Or they'll be hunting, hunting you down. Chapter 14, we might not make it, but I'll just skim through the rest. Mid-tribulation uh, here. We see uh, the 144,000, their mission uh, completed uh, in that way, possibly because at the three and a half year mark, I don't think there's going to be a lot of go uh, evangelism done in the last three and a half years. It's just going to be pure hell on earth as he unleashes what's left. And um, because he does send out the angels and they circle the earth, uh, the angels, and, and they proclaim and they tell men, do not take that mark. You're doomed for hell if you do. And yet, um, most of the earth will take that mark. And um, so, um, the, the wrath of God is basically, uh, chapter 14, um, God speaks and calls out, then he sends out the grim reaper angels uh, as well. And now we see we're in the last uh, stage here, the seven last plagues, the vials of the wrath of God poured out, again, the worst of the worst. 
And the Bible says that the last three and a half years are the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the worst time that the earth has ever seen. It's worse than probably the first half, even though the first half is horrible, right? Revelation 15, once says, Then I saw uh, another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues. For in them the wrath of God is complete. Well, let's look at them. Bowl one, vile or bowl, loathsome sores, loathsome sores. Boy, can you imagine boils all over your body? That's loathsome. I mean, wow, one boil is bad enough, right? But these sores breaking out all over your body. It's misery, night and day. Uh, people will, the men will try, people will try to kill themselves. They won't be able to. The Lord says, no, you're not going to get to die. Why don't you repent instead of just dying of that? So uh, the sea to blood, uh, bowl two, bowl three, the waters to blood. It's kind of similar to what we see in the first, um, uh, second sec section with the trumpets. Um, but this time they're turned to blood, and that's the fullness of this judgment uh, of the Lord. Bowl four, men scorched. Bowl five, darkness and pain. Uh, again, the Bible says they're still unrepentant, still won't repent. Euphrates dries up. Again, this is God's uh, structuring everything toward the end. Why does he do that? Because he prepares a way for these massive armies to come in toward Jerusalem. What is, it, what is the world doing uh, with all of this when they know this is a judgment of God? Uh, Satan is rallying all of these powerful nations, and, uh, and they are in agreement that what we need to do is we need to take out Jesus. They're seeing all these things in heaven, and they're, and they're going to come to kill the Lord. They're coming into Jerusalem, and they're going to meet the Lord. And again, there's some discrepancy here, but it's possible that the Lord with us, uh, with him, appear in the sky for days and uh, the Lord begins to call them, basically pressure them, and he allows them to get in past the Euphrates, these massive armies coming into the uh, valley of Megiddo, the Megiddo Valley. If you've ever been there, there's more wars there than any other place on earth. More blood has been spilled. It's just a valley where everybody can come in and fight. And uh, the nations and, have been doing that for centuries. But God's going to lure in all of these powerful armies with all of their military, all of their rockets, all of their nukes, and all of their things there. And he's going to get them in there and he, uh, through this dry Euphrates. And then what's he going to do after that? Uh, the mother of all earthquakes um, is going to take place. And the whole topography of the earth is going to change. The uh, islands of the earth are going to go away. Basically, we're going to start getting set up for what the Lord's going to inherit. Again, he's not going to get a new heaven and a new earth. That's in the eternal state. But when the Lord comes, there, all of the islands have already been put down. The mountains have been put down. We're kind of going in reverse, going back to where it was before the flood. That's what happened in the flood. The, the, the earth broke open, and then, the, again, mountains went up, and, and everything was um, um, changed. So the top, topography will change, and the topography of Jerusalem will change, and it'll be elevated and it'll be divided in three uh, portions there uh, for the Lord's kingdom. So all that's going to take place. But what is he going to do when all that happens? It's going to trap these armies in Megiddo. Millions and millions and millions and millions. And they're going to be stuck there. And the Lord says, for the slaughter, he's going to slaughter them. But they're coming to kill him. And uh, that's an amazing thought, that the man, man would see God and would want to kill him. But that's what's going to happen. Got a few more, uh, a couple more minutes. So well, I'm gonna get this race through. Okay, so chapter eight, um, chapter seventeen and eighteen, he takes out the woman who rides the beast and the beasts uh, Babylon. So all this empire, all this power, all of it, uh, the structure of it. Not these armies. They're gonna take them out too. But all, all that they've built, this world empire, is all gonna go down in flames. And again, as he takes out this woman, she's all drunk with the blood of the martyrs, and they've been pursuing and hating God and killing everyone who follows the Lord, and he's going to take all of it down. It's all going to burn, and the whole earth's going to just weep and cry that, you know, this great thing, basically our Babel has been torn down, and uh, they're not going to weep and repent. They're going to be heartbroken that the party's over, whatever party that would be. And the world mourns in, uh, um, 
as the Lord uh, takes all of that down. So 19 and 20, um, we're going to see the judgment um, take place. First, we see Jesus appearing with his bride, and uh, which is an amazing thing. Um, he's ready for the marriage of uh, here. The marriage takes place in the air. And then we see that probably in the millennial beginning of the millennial kingdom, we'll see the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then we'll see all the nations and all of us uh, believers come together and have a wonderful feast after this is all over. And then he defeats the nations with the sword of his mouth. Again, it's not going to take, the Lord's not going to break a sweat over any of that. And all of them will go down. They'll be dead. A lot of uh, descriptions of this. Then he um, has already defeated the kingdoms of the Antichrist and the false prophet. Now he takes both of them and he... Uh, um, uh, in the judgment, and he, he puts them away forever. These are two men that were probably possessed by Satan, and uh, the earth sees that, that judgment as well. And then he takes Satan, and um, he uh, uh, puts Satan down, and he chains him away. Then the Lord comes and sets up his kingdom. At this time, the Bible says that all the dead martyred uh, saints... They're all going to get their new bodies. It's called the second resurrection, um, and that'll be a, a, a time they, they are there robed in spirit, but they don't have bodies, so he's going to give them new, uh, new bodies. Then we see a thousand years of peace, and I won't go through all of that with you, but we know at the end he's going to release Satan again. Why? Because there's going to be a lot of people born during the thousand years of peace. But everybody who goes in after the, all of the judgments are only going to be believers. But after a thousand years, they're going to have children, aren't they? And then everybody needs to be able to make a choice. Do you want to follow Jesus who rules uh, on his throne, righteous? Now, wouldn't you think everybody, 100% of the world would say, yes, we can see how beautiful it is. No, it's not going to happen. When Satan is released, a whole rebellion is going to come forth, and a multitude is going to do the same thing that this multitude did, is they're going to go to try to kill Jesus. Now, it's one thing to say, I'm not going to serve you, God. It's another thing to say, I want to kill you, God, right? So the Lord puts it down. Then he has the final judgment. He calls up all the wicked dead, and he judges them. It's called the Great White Throne Judgment. And then uh, he institutes, the Bible says he puts away all the heavens and the earth, makes a new heavens and a new earth, which is basically everything that we see, and we enter into the eternal state. Got to stop there. Um, amazing there. Then he turns to John at the end. Uh, the picture of heaven, uh, we dwell with the Lord. He's the center of it. And then um, uh, he says to him, now, why don't you go tell the church this uh, story here? Why don't you tell them? Uh, what the Lord is going to do. It's an encouragement. And uh, he, he says, because I'm coming quickly. And then John says, even so, Lord, come quickly. And I can't wait for you to get here. I feel the same way. Let me close real quick. Lord, thank you for this awesome book. Um, we just pray, Lord, you let that sink into us. You're awesome. You're great. You're powerful. We can rest in you no matter what goes on in this earth. Uh, you got us. Uh, we love you tonight. We love to see the glory and greatness of your son and uh, for you on your throne in righteousness and holiness and look forward to the day when that will rule over all the earth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.